you know, there's you, you can argue about how long legislative session goes or whatever. But when you you got the little guy who's got a small business and missed and the big corporation with all its lobbyists comes in and snatches that guy's property, his his life's work away from him. That's extremely unfair. The Colorado Constitution plainly forbids it, and the courts allow it, and it happens all the time. Of course, you know and love Dave Kopel from his work on Colorado Inside Out. You know that he works at the Independence Institute as, let's see, research director, head of our Second Amendment project. You most likely know him from his roles in action movies and his, well, his former career as a professional wrestler. So glad you could join us. Thank you very much, and uh, I'll be facing off with Hulk Hogan's uh, <laughs> next week. Yeah, Hulk will kill you. All right, I want to talk about this because I've never met, I've known you, I don't know how long I've known you, 30 years almost. Yeah. And you write, and you write, and you write. This is your latest work, and you got this done in a week, which I think is really yeah. impressive. It's about the Colorado Constitution. It's the Colorado Constitution Law and History. Among your many other side jobs, you teach constitutional law, including Colorado's Constitution. Is there anybody else that teaches it? No, that's a really sad thing about our, we have two law schools in the state, and I teach at Denver University as an adjunct and, and created this course on Colorado constitutional law. Uh, at uh, CU, there's actually a professor who's written a good treatise on the topic, uh, but there are no classes on it. And co state constitutions are so important for the day-to-day -day practice of law and of, and of constitutional law in particular, but they're uh, greatly undertaught in American law schools. Before we talk about uh, the book, the Colorado Constitution happens 100 years after the founding of the nation, where the centennial state, and you yeah. ask people, and they don't know why, it's because yeah. it happened in the centennial of the nation. What is different about this as a Western state constitution compared to all the old states in the, in the, in the East? Well, the, the U.S. Constitution and most of the, uh, the early state constitutions of, of the 13 colon colonies that then became states were pretty terse documents. I mean, some of them were created during wartime and even after in the 18th century, the sort of the view was you, you state some key principles in the Constitution and you make it a fairly short document. And that, that was working pretty well on the U.S. Constitution because it's a government of enumerated powers. The federal government, it was understood at the time, could only do certain things the Constitution said it did. And other than that, everything else was left to the states. But the problem with short state constitutions, the American people found out, is they let the state legislatures get away with all kinds of things, especially making deals to give the taxpayers money to big business. And that was, and is, rampant. So mid to late 19th century state constitutions like Colorado are much longer than the U.S. Constitution, and they really work, among other things, to try to keep the legislature under control. Would it be fair to say that the federal constitution was a first in man's history that the idea of the document was to contain government, to say, here are the boundaries, here, and outside of this, you don't have any authority, and that Colorado's constitution, in a way, given its time, was like that too, in that it was built after seeing how much how states have been abusing their powers to also build some guardrails around what the state government could do. Yeah, I, I think you'd find some similarities there. Now, you, you can go yeah. back all the way to things like Magna Carta in 1215, right. which says the government can't do certain things. Uh, but uh, Colorado's constitution also says, hey, there are some things that are just off limits because our, our Bill of Rights... Uh, starts with three sections declaring general principles that they're legally enforceable, including that all people have certain natural, inherent, unalienable rights. And so in, in those matters, the, our government never had any power in the first place. On top of that, the Colorado Constitution, throughout the structure of a state and local government, works very hard to put in specific procedures, uh, particularly uh, to prevent government favoritism to business. Like what? Like government going into business with business, government giving special loans, to government giving loans to business, uh, government giving business uh, irrevocable privileges. 
government passing special legislation to benefit business, government giving money to biz, uh, entities that are not under the control of the government. So everything you just said sounds like daily operating procedure in today's legislature as far as tax breaks for certain industries, uh, uh, mandates, the renewable mandates and uh, destroying oil and gas and all the rest. It sure seems like the intent to keep business and government separated has not worked as far as I can see today. Yeah. Maybe before. Yeah. Now, the, the Colorado Constitution isn't against regulation of right. business for health and safety. In fact, the Article 16, which is on mining and water, actually orders the legislature uh, to enact mine safety laws and also talks about mine, mine laws for mine drainage and things like that. So the, the Colorado Constitution is definitely not something for a do-nothing government, but it is for a, it, it's a do-the-right-thing government. And part of the do-the-right-thing government is big business will succeed or fail depending on how they do in winning customers. And they don't get to go to the taxpayers and say, take the money out of the taxpayer's pocket and put it in the big business pocket. It's but that funny because I'm pretty sure that is the Excel, uh, <laughs> Excel Energy model of why they're so profitable in Colorado. Absolutely. They have, among other things, they have a state-created monopoly, which is, certainly sounds like a special privilege to me. Um, but the starting in the 1920s and then getting worse and worse every decade thereafter, the Colorado Supreme Court has basically nullified the anti-corporate welfare provisions of the Colorado Constitution. So, for example, Article 11, which is on debt, says very clearly, you can't give any aid to any corporation or business or private entity in any form whatsoever. I mean, you read the actual In other clause. words, put it in layman's terms. We, the government of Colorado, we ain't your bank. We're not going to give you, a private company, a loan. Yeah. If you want to borrow money, go ask a bank right. or go ask your rich friends or whatever, but don't go borrowing money from the state of Colorado. And yet the Colorado Supreme Court, and it's, it, it still does it today, but this is a decades-long practice, has overturned that and says, oh, well, if you give them, here's, an, here's the classic case, Adams County wants to get Ralston Purina to build a, uh, a plant in Adams County. So Adams County says, oh, Ralston Purina, you don't have to borrow the money on that nasty old private bond market. We'll borrow the money and we can do it at 2% lower interest rates because it's, it's federally okay. tax exempt. Right. And we'll borrow the money for you and then uh, you can use that money uh, to build your, your agricultural feed plant. And the Colorado Supreme Court says, oh, that's okay because there's a public purpose behind it and the public purpose is it's going to help the economy. All right. So going through, I tell you what, I want, I want to skip to the, uh, towards the end here. Uh, I read the whole thing. You've got a semicolon on page 348 where it should be a uh, comma. But uh, other than that, I found no errors. There are, there are other similar errors in there. All right. This is what got me. Um, at the end, in your conclusion, you've got this thing that says about 7% of the Colorado Constitution has been nullified by the state government, including the judiciary, so the courts. And you list out, oh my God, it must be 25 different examples of our, uh, articles and sections in the Constitution that have been nullified. Uh, just grab, grab one or two. Yeah. Colorado presidential electors shall be chosen by direct vote of the people of Colorado. Right. Where did they nullify that? When they uh, adopted this so-called national popular vote, which says that Colorado's electoral vo electors, who elect the president, won't be chosen by the people. They'll be chosen by the Secretary of State of Colorado based on the Secretary of State's count on who won the national popular vote. So if a candidate loses in Colorado, but comes in ahead in the national popular vote, then Colorado's electors not, are not chosen by the people of Colorado. They're chosen by the Secretary of State. Article 2, I think it's Section 2, no irrevocable special privileges. That sounds pretty cool. That sounds like a constitutional thing. Yeah. When I mean, was that nullified? All the time when we give businesses special privileges. 
Right to keep and bear arms may not be called into question. Yeah, so not called into question is a, a term of art, and it's the strongest way in constitutional drafting at the time you could say something. In, in fact, it's uh, a direct parallel to the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, Section 4, which says that the debt of the United States may not be questioned. So when the you know, government issues treasury bills, there's no way the government can repudiate them. They can't say, oh, we've got a really important government interest. We need the money for something else. We'll pay you back later, maybe. It's just impossible off the table. And yet our Colorado Supreme Court says you can do any kind of gun ban, magazine ban, whatever you want, restrict the right to keep and bear arms, um, unless it means there are no arms available for anyone. This one is just too easy. Article 2, Section 14, private property shall not be taken for private use. That means government's not going to use eminent domain, take that land and give it to that guy over there. Exactly. Like you, you take the small business and, you know, some guy's got an auto repair shop, government takes his property and gives it to the developer who wants to build a shopping mall. Again, this has been nullified. It's at, well, yeah, and the language you just read says that kind of thing is absolutely prohibited. And it also says that if somebody says, oh, my, you, you took my property and it was, you gave it to a private individual um, or, or business, uh, the question of whether that's really for public use, that's for the courts to decide. But the Colorado Supreme Court has said, no, anytime the legislature says the taking is for a public purpose, like the private business will help the economy, that's good enough. Referendum may only be barred for quote, laws necessary for the immediate preservation of the public peace, health, or safety. So one of the most important parts of our Constitution was added in, in Article 5, Section 1. It was added in 1910. And this How did you know that? You got that right. Yeah. Look at you. And this was, this was the, one of the, the trinity of progressive reforms of the era. And our, our great uh, uh, progressive Democratic Governor Shafroth uh, with the help of progressive Republican Theodore Roosevelt. They, they finally got it onto the ballot, and the, the people adopted it. And so now in Colorado, we have the right to create new laws by initiative, by the people signing a petition and putting it on the ballot. And we also have a right, when the legislature enacts a law, to a referendum to say, oh, we're not so sure they did the right thing. Let's you get enough petitions. We'll have a vote on it. But... And they, inc they include. The easy, I think that yeah. layman's way of saying that is, legislature can pass a bill and the governor can veto it, but we the people can also veto it exactly. by having a referendum after it, it was passed. Exactly. And there's an exception in the Constitution that says you can't have a referendum for something that's immediately necessary for the pub preservation of the public safety, health, or welfare. You know, so if there were a uh, uh, well, uh, an insect, a, a locust invasion, um, which definitely happened plenty of times in, in early Colorado. And we say, okay, we, we got to start spending the money now for locust eradication. You know, we want to pass the bill on a March 31st and start spending the money on April 3rd. We got to do it immediately. We can't have this thing delayed till November by it's some referendum. Right. Exactly. So the Colorado Supreme Court has said, any time the legislature says, it's for the immediate preservation of public safety, health, or welfare. That's decisive, and we don't care. I see this all the time. It's at the end of any bill. It either has the referendum ending or the emergency, the safety clause. And if the safety clause, that means you, we, can't, we can't veto it. And I swear to God, most legislators don't even know that that safety clause doesn't have to be there. I've heard people say, I just thought that's how you ended every bill. Right. <laughs> when, you know, so when the, when the legislature passes a bill to name the rainbow trout or uh, the cutthroat trout the state fish, yeah, it does it so it's off for the immediate preservation of public peace, health, and safety. That's, that's yes. laughable. Yeah, and as the book talks about, the, the designation of our state's official square dance uh, was... Hey, was Hey, if, you, if, if you've gotten hurt on the dance floor, that was for public safety. You don't want to be doing the unofficial I, I, pardon square me for, dance. For, for just doing this too much, but these are so ridiculous. 
The General Assembly regular session limited to 120 calendar days. Now we find out that calendar days have to be consecutive. Uh, try that with your uh, mortgage company when they want things done in a calendar day. Yeah, and the funny thing is in the, the court's four to three decision uh, a couple of years ago on that one, where it says, oh, calendar days means it's a day on the calendar. Like, I didn't know there were other kinds of days, um, but they don't have to be consecutive. The court just a few years before that had interpreted a, uh, a civil procedure statute that referred to 15 calendar days. And the court, of course, understood what calendar days meant then. And it says it means 15 days in a row. So, for example, you, would, you wouldn't count legal holidays. Or you would count legal holidays. It doesn't matter. Um, 15 calendar days means you start on day one and just go one, you know, through the right. calendar. And th according to the 4-3 Colorado Supreme Court, oh, that's ambiguous. It, it is amazing to me how the courts in Colorado have have just changed language so easily. I, I want to get to Tabor in a second, but I'll just do a couple more of these. Yeah. Bills must contain a single subject. These are in the Constitution. Yes. Our, our Supreme Court there is there to uphold this Constitution, yeah. not to rewrite it. Bills must have a single subject. If this, is a, if this is a bill to fund midnight basketball, you can't use it to build a train system. That, that's right. And, and in that way, the, the, that, that's still enforced. But what happens is the, the, the classic thing is the, the District Attorney's Council comes in every year and say, we've got our laundry list of two dozen changes we want made in the criminal law. And they're related in the sense that they all relate to crim criminal law in some way. Uh, but th you know, that, that's a very diverse set of things. And they get the bill with the title concerning criminal law and have, have their laundry list of all kinds of disparate topics. No extra compensation to government employees or contractors. Does it mean no bonuses? No tips? It, it, it means you don't get paid, if you're a government employee, you don't get paid beyond what your salary schedule is. And that's been nullified? I would actually have to look that one up. I'm, I'm, I, uh, I, I forgot the details on ah, that one. Got you on that one. This one, which I can't believe, it's so straightforward. All bills for raising revenue must init be initiated in or originate in the House, yeah. not the Senate. But yet the Senate keeps popping out bills that raise revenue, either through taxes or their taxes that they call fees. Right, and, and raising revenue would include hasn't taxes this, hasn't or this fees. Hasn't this one gone to the Supreme Court? Um, the, uh, those cases go back to almost the turn of the century, and the Supreme Court has said, well, that's okay because the revenue bill also had some other subject in it, and, you know, like uh, you were raising money for, the, you were writing laws about the public schools, and you were raising money for it, so you can start that in the Senate. Nor shall any distinction or classification of pupils be made upon account of race or color. Yeah. So that, that's one of the, this is a 1876 constitution. And the, the really, this is an 1876 constitution after the Civil War, and it was very clear what this was, uh, was about. Yeah, and it was, among other things, an absolute rejection of what was going on in, in the former Confederate states, uh, where they were, uh, you had racially segregated uh, education and Colorado said absolutely not under no no circumstances you can't not only you can't have separate but equal schools you just can't classify pupils anyway anyhow by race or color and how is that nullified well we, we saw that just this December when one of the uh, schools in the Denver public school system uh, had a uh, uh, families of color uh, play night which you know apparently for the people who are lack color, supposedly. <laughs> uh, they can't come. And each, they're certainly made to feel unwelcome. This one is incredible. Each property tax... Oh, and by the way, the, the University of Colorado uh, has racially segregated housing. Uh, in the, it's, sadly, it's in, in the Hallett Hall, which is named after the great Colorado judge Moses Hallett. Uh, but they've got certain parts of University of Colorado. You can't live in the dorm unless you're, you're the correct color. Each property tax levy shall be uniform upon all real and personal property. All right. What does that mean? How is it nullified? 
it means if you're going to tax real property, you know, like your house, All right. you have to have the same rate. Whatever the tax tax rates are, they they got to be the same. And the Colorado Constitution is very concerned with fairness. They don't want, you know, some definition that, well, if you have a mansion that's over 11,000 square feet, you know, because Bill Gates has a great lobbyist, that gets taxed at a different rate than other housing. But the legislature all the time classified, chops property into different classes and subclasses and sub-subclasses so they can give special property tax breaks uh, to the powerful and everybody else has to pay more. Including, I'd add in there, tiffs and piffs where they're not actually property tax breaks, but they're sales tax breaks and other breaks for Ikea, but not for mom and pop's furniture store. Well, and right, and that, that's the prohibitions on special privileges for corporations and on, on special legislation, uh, such as special did, legislation for a business. How did we get to a point? The, the textbook is Colorado Constitutional Law and History. So there's two parts there. Law, yeah. we've been talking about, but yeah. the history. How was it that this Constitution, which was based upon fairness, and you, as you said, yeah. you see it all over, and a check and balance to keep businesses from perverting government. How is it that historically that has switched so badly now that the original intent of the Constitution seems to be forgotten? Well, one example is something that the uh, Colorado Convention of 1875-1876 of absolutely un understood was they expected the legislature to steal everything that wasn't nailed down. It was a bipartisan convention, 24 Republicans, 15 Democrats, and there, there were no, this was not at all partisan. Wherever the delegates disagreed, like, should we put God in the preamble, things like that. They never had splits on partisan issues. And they were pretty unanimous in their fear uh, of what le the legislature would do because they didn't expect the Colorado legislature in the long run to be any more honest than the right. legislature of Tennessee or Illinois or Louisiana or, or New York. So they built in all these protections and expected the legislature would try to violate everything. And so in, in our system, the, the backstop on that is the courts to enforce what the Constitution says because the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. And for a lot of the 19th century, the, the Colorado Supreme Court often did so. But then over the course of the 20th century and continuing now, the Colorado Supreme Court sometimes did and still does enforce parts of the Constitution. But a lot of it, they just kind of gave up. All right. So the textbook, by the way, I want to make sure people, people who have need some bedtime reading material, available on Amazon, I'm assuming? Or it's available it? on Amazon. All the, the Amazon search thing is messed up. Colorado Constitutional Law and History, go to, go to my website. DaveCopel.org. It's all one word, D-A-V-E-K-O-P-E-L. And close to the top, you'll see four different ways to buy the book from Amazon, from Barnes & Noble. There's something called Indie Book where you can actually order it online and pick it up from your favorite local bookseller, or you can buy it from the publisher directly. Are you worried that since you've, you've called out the legislature and you've sure called out the Colorado courts, I mean, you are, uh, you're a lawyer here, you're in the Colorado bar, um, are you throwing stones or are you making an argument that the Colorado courts have really failed the Constitution? They've certainly failed a lot of parts of the Constitution. And the oath a Colorado lawyer takes, it's a seven-part oath. and You know the significance of seven in all kinds of uh, mythological and religious things. Um, one of the oaths is to defend the Constitution of the United States and of the state of Colorado. So my duty as a lawyer is to the Constitution and not no. to particular government actors. And by the way, that oath goes down to, I was on the RTD board, if you're on the city council, if you're on the water department board, you take an oath and the oath is to the Constitution and the Colorado Constitution. It, it really, it's not, not, to, not to anything else, but to that. Yes. Do you think the Colorado Supreme Court over history has kept that oath? Sometimes yes and sometimes no. And this, the, the textbook also talks about the times when they, they have up, upheld the Constitution. 
is there any in, in the hall of shame for you? Is there what 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 are the Colorado courts? I mean, I I will tell you mine, and it won't be a surprise. But what would yours be? Well, well we have so I many have to, to choose I have from. To pick just one. I mean, there's some that are just so blatantly obvious. You know, they're well, I, I, I guess. Days. Yeah, I, I guess I, I I'd say that the taking of private property for public use. Yeah. You know, there's you, you can argue about how long legislative session goes or whatever, but when you you got the little guy who's got a small business and missed and the big corporation with all its lobbyists comes in and snatches that guy's property, his his life's work away from him, that's extremely unfair. The Colorado Constitution plainly forbids it, and the courts allow it, and it happens all the time. This is incredible. We're going to make sure everybody in the state legislature who uh, has a copy of this, because it's not just your students at DU. It's a whole lot of people who, who have taken the oath haven't really understood the Constitution. As Last question, very last question. Every state has its own Constitution. How does this one rank? How does Colorado's rank from your point of view? You know, if... I'm a Colorado chauvinist. I think it's wonderful. I think I think it's one of the best. I mean, I can't say I've read because because it has a lot of specifics on the process of how legislation is passed, designed to control things and prevent you know last minute sneaky bills, things like that. It has so many provisions to keep things fair, so that the the big guy doesn't get to use the government to take from the little guy. And it has very strong uh, protections in its Bill of Rights. So, I mean, on, on, on paper, I, th- I think it's just wonderful. The problem is in the courts, a lot of those provisions uh, get nullified. Dave, thanks a lot. We'll do it again. Thank you. If you enjoyed that conversation, by all means, click one of these other great programs. We have the best conversations with the most fascinating Coloradans. And subscribe to our channel. Just click down below and hit that little bell button too. You don't want to miss a single show.